Hello, hello. Welcome to the Ideas Sleep Furiously podcast. I'm Matt Archer. What you're about to listen to is a fascinating debate from 2006 between two leading scholars in intelligence research, Charles Murray and James Flynn. I recently found this in the deep dark corners of YouTube and it was split up into 12 parts as it had clearly been uploaded back in the day when YouTube only allowed 10 minute uploads. So I'm sure many people haven't heard this debate and having the whole thing in one place would make it much more likely that more people will hear it. Of course I want to stress that I don't own the rights to this clip. I believe the event was sponsored by the American Enterprise Institute but I haven't been able to find the recording anywhere else. I've cleaned up the audio and edited out some dead air. Unfortunately, there are some cuts in the original recording, so you occasionally miss a few words. Now, if you're interested in intelligence, then you'll find many more interesting conversations between myself and leading researchers on my channel, so do subscribe for that. I also have a substack linked below where I post some of my own research and the research that I find interesting. So with all the shilling out the way, I hope you enjoy this wonderful conversation between two giants of the field. Charles Murray and the late James Flynn. Ladies and gentlemen, can we come to order, please? My name is Chris DeMuth. I'm president of the American Enterprise Institute and uh, happy to welcome you all here this morning to this seminar on the black-white IQ gap. Is it closing? Will it ever go away? Intelligence, smartness, mental aptitude, has many different meanings in popular conversation and some somewhat more precise meanings among psychometricians and social scientists who study the subject for a living. Uh, but it is certainly related to one's performance on recognized, standardized aptitude and IQ tests. There's no doubt uh, that it is in part a heritable genetic trait and in part a consequence of environmental factors such as nutrition, health status, family circumstances, and culture. But the relative importance of nature versus nurture and the interaction between them are complex and durably controversial subjects. Different groups, racial, national, ethnic, men versus women, differ in IQ as measured by standardized tests just as they differ in other attributes such as stature, physiognomy, and prowess at different pursuits and occupations. <clears throat> Those differences have sometimes been the source of acute social and intellectual contention. They've sometimes amounted to close to fighting words, although these sensitivities seem to have receded somewhat in recent years for a variety of reasons. In any event, the sensitivities have often seemed to arise from a misunderstanding about the meaning of group differences. It means differences in the means and the distribution around the means within large populations and is not a reference to all of the populations or to any, in, in any particular individual. We have at this seminar this morning two individuals who have done important research on IQ in general and on group differences between blacks and whites in particular. <clears throat> James Flynn we're delighted to have with us uh, uh, today uh, on a, a tour he's taking of the United States and of uh, England is a distinguished uh, 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 psychologist and moral philosopher. Uh, he is professor of emeritus at the University of Otago in Land of the Rings territory in, on the South Island of, uh, of New Zealand. Uh, he is the author of, he is the student, developer, proponent, and researcher of the Flynn effect, the upward drift of IQ scores from generation to generation and sometimes from year to year, a phenomenon that he has documented in many different nations and cultures <clears throat> and has applied in particular to African Americans. He has written several uh, uh, important uh, papers on the subject recently uh, co-authored with uh, William Dickens of the Brookings Institution who is with here with us today. Uh, their most recent work mentioned in, in uh, Jim's uh, uh, biography is in the uh, documents we passed out today and we've also in included a little ad uh, for Professor Flynn's new book What is Intelligence Beyond the Flynn Effect which uh, Cambridge University will publish uh, next uh, August and which is already accessible on the web website uh, we have uh, provided. Charles Murray is the William H. Brady Fellow 
at the American Enterprise Institute, the author of many important works of, uh, on government policy and uh, social science, most notably The Bell Curve, Intelligence and Class Structure in American Life, uh, a magisterial work which was hotly controversial when published in 1994. Uh, it is aging well, and uh, many of the matters uh, that uh, it uh, asserted are becoming uh, conventional wisdom. Charles and his co-author Richard Herrnstein coined the term the Flynn effect uh, in, their, uh, in their book. Charles is, uh, has also continued to work on subjects uh, pertinent to today's discussion, and a recent article of his, also referenced in the biographical material, has been uh, distributed uh, in the uh, has been distributed to everyone here. Uh, I'm going to get out get out of the way and to let these two uh, esteemed uh, students of the subject uh, speak. Uh, we will have 25-minute uh, uh, presentations, first from Professor Flynn and then from Mr. Murray. Uh, each of them will have uh, 10 minutes or so uh, to uh, respond uh, to the others. I may uh, encourage them to mix it up a little bit up here at the podium, but we'll move as quickly as I can to questions, uh, comments, uh, discussions uh, among the general audience. Professor Flynn, welcome to AEI. Thank you for coming here. The podium is yours. Can you hear me now? You hear me now? Okay. Well, in 20 to 25 minutes, you can usually make three or four points. That's what my students have accustomed me to do. So the three or four points I'm going to make are first to discuss Klaus Eiferth and the study that he made of the black and white children left behind in Germany by the American troops that occupied Germany after World War II. I think you'll find his results of interest. Then, oddly enough, I'm going to talk about men and women and how their height differs as they age. And then I'm going to talk about the most recent data on the black-white IQ gap and what I think it means. And you'll have to take on faith for a moment that these two things will illuminate the last. Now, Eiferth was that rare person, both a good social scientist and a decent human being, rather like Charles Murray and myself, not many of them. <laughs> and he was interested in the welfare of these occupation children because in almost every instance they were being raised in solo parent homes. They were mainly illegitimate children. Most of you know that there was a large American occupation army in Germany after World War II, and of course they had sexual relations with German women and they left behind children who were either entirely white or were half black because the American father was black. I first wondered if these children would be at a grave disadvantage in the German educational system and therefore tested their IQs. Unfortunately, his samples were not large. We have IQ scores for 170 all-white children and 69 or 70 half-black children, that is, those with black fathers. But still, his results were interesting. He found that when he tested their IQs on the WISC, which is an intelligence test of impeccable credentials, the Wechsler Intelligence Scale for Children, that they came out almost exactly even. That is, for the total samples, I think the whites were 97 and the blacks were 96 and a half, something of that sort. Now, I ought to say that there is one confounding variable here, and that is that the U.S. Army gave mental tests to screen soldiers before they allowed them into the Army in World War II, and more blacks flunked that test than whites. So you can't look upon the soldiers in Germany as random samples of the larger population. The whites are pretty much. They only flunked 2 or 3% of whites. And I spent a whole summer at Suitland in very hot conditions looking up in the archives all of the Army mental test scores for soldiers in Germany, which took me the entire summer. And uh, I found that the whites were pretty much, I was convinced, uh, in Germany a random sample of the Army, and the Army was a random sample of U.S. males. The blacks, I decided, were probably somewhat below a random sample. The ones in Germany were a random sample of blacks in the army, 
but they had cut out the lower half. And I would say that if you looked at IFIRST findings, you would say that the normal 15-point IQ gap between black and white would have to be put at about a three-point gap because there is this three-point factor of cutting out people, the blacks with the lower IQs. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that three points of the IQ gap is genetic because there was ample testimony that the black kids had a harder time. There was no black subculture in Germany, and I'll come to that later, perhaps during the question period, because that's crucial. And that I think that the black subculture in America, particularly the teenage subculture, is a factor in the IQ gap. So these black kids in Germany had no black subculture, but it was visible that their mother had an illegitimate child obtained from sleeping with the enemy. If you're a white mother, you could go to the next town and you were just a solo mother with a child. If you had a child by a black service man from America, you were not just a solo mother, but you had clearly consorted with the enemy and had a child by American soldiers. How much difference this wake makes, we will never know. Uh, but in the records that I read at Suitland, there were some testimony that I first had collected and others uh, that some of these kids had a tougher road to hoe than average. So many people take I Firth as essentially saying that the IQ gap between black and white is entirely environmental. The sample is too small, and while I did everything I could to calculate what the remaining IQ gap should be, I know what the numbers are. At this point, though, I want to make two points about I Firth that are often overlooked. And that is, if you look at the black and white children, not only were they equivalent for IQ, they were equivalent for G, the general intelligence factor. That is, not only was there no IQ gap between them, but there was no G factor gap. Now, I want to say a bit about that. I'm not going to explain it in detail, but the G loading of an IQ test is correlated with its complexity. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be interested in it. But the higher the G loading of an IQ test, you can take that as an index of the complexity of the mental task. For example, tying your shoes would have a very low G loading, uh, while do calculus would have a pretty high one. Or to use something from the WISC, they have digit span forward and backward. And digit span forward is just giving numerals back in the order you heard them. And that has a relatively low G loading because it's not very complicated, is it? It's mainly a test of rote memory. While digits span backwards, you have digits read out in random order, and then you have to reverse the order in which you heard them. And that has a much higher G loading. It's a more complicated task, isn't it? And blacks in America not only have a lower mean IQ than white, they have a slight tendency to do worse the greater the complexity of the mental task. That disappeared in Germany, and I think that's highly interesting for reasons I'll give in a moment. There is also in America a tendency for the black IQ gap to widen with age. As you can see here, our most recent data puts it at the age of four, and whites are set at 100, that black kids have an IQ of about 95.4. And then you'll note that over 10 years, it goes down by a full six points. So at 14, it's about 89.4. And by the age of 24, it's down another six points. So it's down to 83.4, isn't it? What a pity that the numbers of I Firth aren't greater. He did chart the IQ gap by age, but the numbers, as you can imagine, with only 69 blacks, the numbers at various ages were even smaller because it wasn't a longitudinal study. It was testing kids of various ages. So, you know, there are only about 20 or 25 in each of the three age groups. But insofar as we can plot it, the black marginally ahead of whites at the age of seven were a couple of more than the white age of 12. Now, if we could only be sure that in the German environment, the tendency to drop with age had disappeared, that would be truly significant. Keep that in mind. One way of illustrating its significance 
is to turn to male and female, and I'll draw an analogy. There we know there is a genetic difference in height, don't we? No one would doubt that most boys and girls in America, uh, you know, it isn't that the parents starve the girls and feed the boys. They have pretty good nutritional equivalents. So when boys end up taller than girls, we know we're dealing with a genetic factor. We're also dealing with a gap that shifts with age. Girls reach their maximum height at about 14 or 15, and boys go right on growing in height to about 18 or 20. So I've got in both the difference in mean height and I've got in the decline with age. For complexity, I'll choose the axle. Uh, people see ice skating, don't you? And you probably know that the more complicated the jump, the axle, the harder it is for women to keep up with men. That is, men can do a double axle pretty easily, while women struggle a bit. And when you get to the triple axle, well, I think there are only about two women who can do it. And I think the only one who's done a four axle is a man. So in terms of complexity of using your body, we find, again, the same thing. Women tend to fall off the more complexity in the jump. Now, let us imagine that there was a controversy about male and female IQ, and I found a sample of females that I thought was random, but actually, by mistake, I'd got an elite sample. Let's say they're all the upper three quarters of women, okay? Well, that might do a great deal to eliminate the height gap, mightn't it? But it would do nothing to eliminate the growth curve. Even if I took the top three quarters of women in terms of height, they would still not show the same growth spurt between 14 and 20 that men do. And they probably couldn't do the triple or quadruple axle either. That is, the complexity difference would still remain. And the reason these things would remain are that they are genetic traits. And when you take an elite sample, you can certainly iron out a difference in mean height but you're not going to get rid of those other differences. Well, you can all see what my reasoning is, can't you? Even if I first got a mildly elite sample of American blacks, if the loss with age and if the G or complexity factor were genetic, it would be very surprising if a mildly elite sample had eliminated those two things were they genetically determined. So I think we have evidence that not only the black-white IQ gap may be environmental in origin, but even more important and more impressive, the complexity gap may be environmental, and the lose ground with age gap may be environmental. Because I cannot see how sampling could eliminate those last two merely because you had an elite sample. Think about the men and women. Even if you got the upper three quarters of women, you wouldn't get a growth spurt between 14 and 20. It's genetic. And you would still wouldn't get a woman who could do the quadruple axle. You know, they'd be a bitter, bit better at the axles, but they wouldn't close it. They wouldn't close the complexity gap. That's why I say it's such a pity we don't have a better age curve. If we only knew that black kids in Germany lost no IQ ground with whites with age, I think we would be virtually all the way home. Now let me come to the black-white gap. Now there's one test that's an exception to what I'm going to say, and that's the Peabody. Now the Peabody is a picture vocabulary test. It is not a full-fledged IQ test, even though it correlates. And I dismissed the Peabody results as an accurate gauge of the IQ gap between black and whites for this reason. The Flynn effect, as you know, is a study of trends over time. And I have studied trends over time to see how much blacks since 1950 up through 2002 have gone to matching the whites of 1950. That is, my prediction from the Flynn effect was that by the year 2000, blacks in 2000 would be at least as high as whites were in 1950. And they are on most of the subtests, but they still lag on vocabulary. That's their worst result. The blacks of today still cannot match the whites of 1950 in vocabulary.
They beat them in similarities. They beat them in block design. Uh, they beat them in picture arrangement. They beat them in picture completion. And I think vocabulary is an unusual problem for black Americans. And that's why the Peabody results are atypical, you see. When you use full-fledged IQ tests that test all of the various mental skills like the WISC, you know, not just vocabulary and arithmetical thinking, but the whole lot, matrices and picture arrangement and similarities and all these other things, here's the picture Bill Dickens and I got. And I'd like to emphasize another thing. Bill and I think that blacks have come up to this from a lower level over the last 30 years. And we tried to pick what we thought were the best IQ tests and the best samples. But there's another body of data which challenges that, that we think inferior. But let us imagine that data were correct. It still doesn't challenge our current values. It just implies that the black gains might have been made at an earlier date. That is before 1970. That is before the last generation. That's important. But I want to emphasize that aside from the Peabody, I know of no respectable body of data that challenges what I'm about to say. Now, what I'm about to say was are at 95.4. That is less than five points below whites before they go into school. Then they steadily lose on whites six-tenths of a point per year. So after 10 years, they're down six points, aren't they? So now they're only at 89.4. And then by the age of 24, they've lost another six points. So now they're down to 83.4. So note that that age loss, which we might think of as a genetic factor, seems to have disappeared in Germany. And I don't see how elite sampling could be behind it. But the samples are too small for strong inference. What a pity that I first didn't have 700 black children then we would probably be home free. We would know that this age decline was an environmental factor. And if it were an environmental factor, we would know that genetically, blacks were at least at 95.4, wouldn't we? Because if they didn't decline with age, that's what they would stay at. Man, and of course far superior, like myself, a Chicago man, who have done a study with an infant IQ test. Now, I'm not going to say too much about the content of that IQ test because I was cautioned by an American friend who said, if you say too much about that IQ test that they gave eight-month-year-olds, for example, it involves ringing a bell and seeing if an eight-month-old infant will try and find out what's making the noise. And he said, look, if you say too much about that, every professional parent in New York will drive their babies insane by ringing bells at them. <laughs> all day in an effort to convince them that their infants are superior. Because as everyone knows, the child of every New York professional is a genius and, and less proven otherwise. So I'm not going to say too much about the content, but on that test at eight months, that is two thirds of a year, the black kids were at 99. Now that's interesting. And if uh, I project back to conception, they would be at 100. Now, why do they lose perhaps a point between conception and eight months? Well, we, one thing that looking at health statistics, you know, when issues like this are not discussed, prejudice reigns. John Stuart Mill once said, if you want the blooms of bias to blow, kill free debate. You know, if you want uh, misconceptions to reign, then don't discuss an issue. I had always assumed that black mothers, when pregnant, smoked more, took more drugs and more alcohol. The health statistics show that that is not true. There is no evidence whatsoever in the latest health statistics that black pregnant women are less responsible than white women in these three regards. However, they do put on less weight. There is some evidence of less adequate nutrition. So it may be that by the time of birth, which is this dotted line, They've lost a bit, you see, through the fact of lesser nutrition. And that could account for the one point between nine months before you're born and eight months after you're born. Note, however, that there's a special dip between eight months and the age of four. I've drawn it so that line has a greater downward slope. 
You see, from here on, it's six-tenths a year, but during this period, gee, over a period of only three years, they lose almost four points, don't they? So it looks as if the preschool environment of black children may be a very important factor indeed. I recently read a study where the average professional child in a professional home as an infant is surrounded by a daily vocabulary of about 2,500 words, and in the welfare home it's about 600 words. Moreover, when approached as to why they didn't babble with their infants, many black welfare mothers said, what's the point of talking to an infant? They can't talk back, which on one level is perfectly logical that on another level is not good for the cognitive development of the child. So I think that this 95.4, the real problem is not so much prenatal influences as, uh, you know, Arthur Jensen thinks. I don't think it's so much prenatal as between birth and the age of school. That there's, and remember again the special problem of blacks with vocabulary, that is with verbal expression that we talked about earlier. After they enter school until 24, there's that steady downward progression. And uh, when I have more time, I'm sure during the question period, I'll say more about that. I think there are a lot of environmental factors, particularly black youth culture, which does, does it not, speak an atypical dialect of English. That is, here we see the verbal factor coming in again, do we not? So I'll say more about other environmental influences later on. But what I want to emphasize at present is that I think that it is more probable than not, and that is the best you can say with such lean evidence, that the black IQ gap is environmental rather than genetic and all three of its salient features. I think that the mean difference between the two is environmental, that when there's no black subculture, as in Germany, and kids are raised there, even under disadvantageous circumstances, they end up with a mean IQ close to white. Secondly, the complexity factor goes away. That is, there's no G gap between the black and white kids. They do just as well compared to whites on complicated mental tasks as simple ones. And thirdly, we think there might have been no drop with age. And if we knew those things, then I would forget Ifirth and say, look at how many good environmental explanations we have for the present IQ gap in America, particularly if we imagine it not declining with age. You know, all we would then have to explain is why by the age of four, the kids were about four or five points below whites. And I think there are plenty of good explanations for that. Now, how do I stand on time? Okay, well, I'll merely then say that, you know, all of these emotional angst about group differences is, after all, a product of human misery. Uh, my group, Irish Americans, are not beating their heads on the floor that there's an IQ gap between them and Chinese Americans. You know, we don't care much. We sort of think... Look at them, they're crazy. Oh, rather than just wanting a nice civil service job and to talk politics at the local pub, they want all of these glittering prizes. And we, we don't, we, we don't, you, you know, they're, 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 psychology is alien to an Irish American. You know, you don't find them arguing politics at a pub much. They're trying to get promoted. And we, 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 don't, we don't care much about it. And if America could only give all of its citizens a decent life, there would be a lot less interest in something as trivial as IQ. Now, IQ isn't trivial, as Charles Murray will tell you. It has a lot to do with outcomes. And you might say, well, if blacks are lower than whites for IQ, it's inevitable they will have a miserable life. Well, I always think of the Israeli army. The Israeli army doesn't flunk people out with an IQ of 70. They need manpower. And they tell me they find useful jobs for people with IQs of 70 to do. They may not put them on the front line, but there are plenty of things. You know, even a person with that IQ is a lot more flexible than a robot and a lot better than a lawnmower. They can do things, human beings. And they seem to find even people of low IQ have useful roles to play. And if we ever reach that point in America, I think we'll be home free.
When I was a corps chairman in the South, Mrs. Watkins once said to me, she said, you know, she was one of our more courageous people. If someone put a cigarette out on her, she said, try another. You know, she didn't scream. She said, give me another cigarette. Uh, she wasn't easy to break. And she said to me once, when I look at you, I don't see color. And if all Americans had a decent life, I think when we looked at one another, we might still see color, but we would see something else standing behind it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Charles, do you want to go to the podium or? Yes. Okay. Go to the podium. There you go. Well, I have 25 minutes, and the last time I did a run through of this, it took me 27, so I'm going to talk real fast. Uh, I just want to start very briefly by saying that at the time of the bell curve, when a lot of hateful and awful stuff was being said, uh, that Jim Flynn, who was on the opposite side of some of these issues from me, was from the very outset the one who was collegial, who was interested in data, who has always dealt in data and always believed that the people he was arguing with were arguing in good faith. And it's a great pleasure, Jim, to see you again. <clears throat> we also agreed that I'm not going to try to respond to anything he said uh, in my first presentation. This is all completely scripted. The black-white IQ gap, is it closing? Will it ever go away? And I tried this out before we got up here. There we go. Agreement. Uh, the gap did narrow during the 20th century. And Jim Flynn and Bill Dickens have done a lot to uh, help change my mind on this. Probably by the amount that Dickens and Flynn in their 2006 article that you have estimate, maybe even more. And whether it's more depends on, uh, oops, uh, whether it's more depends on what the gap was in the early 20th century. An interesting topic that we might want to take up during the discussion. Disagreements, what I'm going to focus on. Uh, I will be arguing that the narrowing of the gap has stalled for persons born since the 1970s. There are few reasons to expect narrowing to resume, and there are reasons to think that the remaining gap will be with us indefinitely. Okay, first, the narrowing of the gap is stalled. Sources of evidence, you've got IQ standardizations. I'll be using some of the same data. Uh, that Dickens and Flynn use, and the reason I have those data is because Bill Dickens shipped them to me a long time ago without even being asked, uh, which is the kind of collegiality that I appreciate. National admissions tests, studies of no child left behind, and national surveys. IQ standardizations. Strengths. They are individually administered, and they are the most highly G-loaded tests we have. Weaknesses. Items change from standardization to standardization. Not a big deal. I mean, that can be, you know, that, th th these tests are usually pretty well equated. Sample sizes for blacks are small, and that's because, and this is something that all of us who use these standardizations have to remember, you choose a standardization sample so that the IQ company can know that a given score is at a, is at a given place on the national distribution. They are not intended to yield precise measures of group means. And so that means, here's the waist, uh, the whisk, the Wexford child, 300s or 200s, in one case less than that. The uh, Stanford Binet, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back here. Stanford Binet, again, 200s, 135 for 2 to 6. Th these are typical of, of all Ki IQs. There's a Woodcock Johnson. And the reason I, I bring this up is just because you can deal with these data, but it's tricky. I mean, you, have, you cannot make a lot of strong inferences about sample sizes of, of that magnitude. Uh, and it creates problems when you're talking about the magnitudes of the black-white difference. Okay, let me go through each of these quickly. Stanford Binet, we only have versions four and five for which uh, 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 Bill and Jim were able to get data. The others have disappeared down the wormhole of memory. And you have only two data points which do not a trend make. Nonetheless, children ages two to six, uh, or three to six, depending on the standardization, went from 0.95 standard deviations 2.7 sometime during the period 1984 to 94. Uh, I'm going to assume, based on the sign-ups for this presentation, that most of you know what a standard deviation is. Real quickly, for those of you who don't, it's a, it's a metric whereby you can talk about where people are in distributions even though the metrics are different. So that you can have IQ points for one test and you can have other kinds of points for another test. 
If you're one standard deviation different uh, above the mean, you're at the 86th percentile. Uh, that's one way to think about it. Children ages 7 to 11, they were flat. Adults ages 20 to tw 12 to 23, I put adults in quotation marks there, uh, go from 1.11 standard deviations to 0.98. Uh, again, you've got two data points, so we know it happened sometime in the 70s, but we can't be much more precise than that. Uh, Stanford Binet are not the most interesting of these data. The Woodcock Johnson is the one I've been doing a lot of work on recently. Uh, these lines represent the downward slope uh, that starts way back in the 1920s, reaching a low of uh, about 0.8 standard deviations for people born from 1970 to 74, and then it starts to go up again. These regression lines, because that's what they are, uh, are produced by analyses that take standardization into account and a variety of other variables. This is, the, this is ages 6 to 65. Uh, I will not go through the age breakdowns that I also worked with, but we'll come back to that issue later. Here's the, the, the Wexler adult, uh, the revised version, which is the, uh, the colors don't come out very well, the darker dots, and the... Uh, version 3, which is the lighter dots, and those are simple trend lines that I based on those uh, points. Those born 71 to 75, you have the low point. It was going down before that. It goes up again with only a couple of data points. Don't make too much out of that. Uh, after those born in 1971-75. The WISC uh, is the one that uh, Jim and Bill uh, can say, see, we told you so. Uh, there are the three standardizations. The low point at only 0 .09 standard deviations is in 1996 for people born then. Uh, that is the strongest data I think that they have. Let me just show that age effect. Here's what happened if you take the standard, uh, separate, standard uh, separate standardizations. In each case, you have a very steep downward sloping line, which in effect is saying that as they get older, the, the difference increases. I've got to say that this is not typical of the literature. Usually in the literature, you have an increase in the black-white difference of the kind that Jim talked about that is quite steep from infancy until about five or six, and then it very quickly levels off. So there's something to be talked about with that. Moving to admissions tests. Strengths, huge sample sizes. The exact opposite of the standardizations. Weaknesses, items change again. The, the more important things is that this is not representative of the entire population. The SAT or the ACT is representative of people who are going to colleges that require the SAT and the ACT. The pool can change over time. So if you would see a change in the black-white difference, it can simply be that you have a different set of blacks going into the testing pool than you had before. And finally, the tests are not as highly G-loaded as IQ tests. Nonetheless, you can use these. And the reason is that the error is in one direction. The great expansion in the black pool of SAT takers occurred during the test years of the 1970s and the 1980s. If anything, that line at the left showing a reduction in the black-white difference for those born in the 1950s and 60s is understated rather than overstated because the black pool was expanding so rapidly. Conversely, when you see it starting to go up after those born in 1973 to 74, that is probably not an artifact because the pool has been quite stable since then uh, in its socioeconomic composition as well as uh, in its size. That's the SAT verbal. There's the SAT math showing pretty much the same thing. Uh, quick footnote, notice that both of those differences are in the one to one and a quarter standard deviation range, and that's for each test separately. If you combined those tests and had an estimate of the black-white difference on the total SAT, it would be quite high. An interesting issue will bring us back to age issues, which probably should be a major topic during the uh, discussion period. Studies of no child left. Oh, by the way, other admissions tests like the ACT, GRE, LSAT, MCAT tell similar stories. Studies of the No Child Left Behind Act, where we have a, an interesting case of the nation taking tests and holding people's noses to the grindstone or feet to the fire is a better way to put it. Uh, to reduce the black-white difference on standardized test scores, an intensive effort. Uh, a recent source on that is, you can look up on the web, from November 20th, 2006, summarizes a variety of studies that have failed to show uh, any important uh, narrowing of the gap. 
I think the best single source, at least the best I've come across, was published in June 2006 by Jake Yung Lee. It is a very detailed, psychometrically sophisticated analysis of uh, both the NAEP, the National Assessment of Educational Progress, and the state level um, work that's been done. I've highlighted in these quotes from the key findings a few things that we have to keep in mind when we talk about No Child Left Behind. First part in red there I re read for you. The NCLB has not helped the nation and states significantly narrow the achievement gap. The other red part is, despite some improvement in reducing the gap in math right after NCLB, the progress was not sustained. Here's something you really need to remember every time you see a newspaper story about this. State-administered tests tend to significantly inflate proficiency levels and proficiency gains, as well as deflate racial and social achievement gaps in the states. As these states and school systems face severe penalties if they don't come up to the expectations of the act, all sorts of games are being played with these numbers. Turning to national surveys. <clears throat> these are our best sources of data. They have very large samples. They also permit nationally representative estimates. Very important. Weaknesses, well, the weaknesses vary from survey to survey, but generally speaking, these are the best we have. The National Assessment of Educational Progress has been going on for a long time now. I am assured by people who know of the test construction and design that it is psychometrically uh, extremely sound. Uh, I'm going to run through very quickly a whole bunch of results. Again, looking at birth years of the kids and how they do. Reading, nine-year-olds. The low point was hit for uh, kids born in 1979, been flat since then. Reading 13-year-olds, same story. Reading 17-year-olds, same story. Math, nine-year-olds, it was down until the kids born in 1977. It was flat thereafter. In the most recent one, you've got, I think, 0 .03 standard deviations lower than it was in 1977, so that subsequent trend line is very slightly down. NAP math, 13-year-olds, down until well, those born in 1973, flat thereafter. NAP math, down to a low of 1973, up thereafter. Turning now to the Armed Forces Qualification Test, the AFQT, that's the test that uh, Dick Hernstein and I used in the bell curve. You have two norm samples. One was taken from people uh, born in uh, 1957 to 64, and the other from, uh, well, you've got the profile of American youth is what we're using here. One's born in the 1970s. Uh, there are a couple of things about this graph. One is we don't know where the low point was. We know that the year-by-year -year samples go down for the first one and a little bit up for the second. I don't think that's as important as the fact that there was a reduction of about 0.24 standard deviations between the two groups. Uh, but these truncated lines look very much in terms of their shape of the lines we've been looking at otherwise. We now come to the best data for persons born from the 1970s onward. Because my case really is, I agree with Jim and Bill that the gap went down. I am arguing in distinction to them that it stopped for kids born sometime in the 1970s. It's the children of the women in the 1979 cohort of the National Longitudinal Survey of Youth. You may be wondering why these are the best data. <laughs> there are other reasons as well. Um, large samples, black end of over 2,500. The tests are identical over time. Absolutely identical. Most children are tested more than once, which has a bunch of advantages. Sample, this is important. The sample is not limited to children who happen to be in school on the day of testing. They would go out and find the kids who were the children of the women in that uh, survey. <laughs> you have a real problem with almost every other kind of survey, including the NAEP, because they are limited to children who happen to be in school. Uh, it includes both academic achievement tests and a measure of verbal IQ. Here's another very important thing. We have all sorts of background information about those kids. We know there's about the neighborhoods they live in. Most important, we know their mother's IQ. Okay, I'm going to give you the raw results <clears throat> from, the, uh, from the test. Starting with birth years in the mid-1970s and going up to the late 1990s, uh, I will tell you that after putting these data through uh, complex multivariate analyses, what you see is what you get. It doesn't change much. PIAT reading recognition. The initial gap is quite small, and the reason it's quite small is because this is a test with very low G-loading. 
doesn't ask you to read. It really is just asking you to recognize letter groups and things like that. Reading comprehension, a bigger gap because it's more highly G-loaded, uh, also a, an upward trend. The PIAT mathematics, these are achievement tests, still a higher black-white difference and an upward trend for kids born from the mid-1970s through the late 1990s, and the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test that Jim doesn't like very much, uh, same story. Let me turn now to the reasons for pessimism about seeing any further reductions in the gap. A uh, few reasons to expect narrowing to resume and reasons to think that it won't. Beginning with the question, well, what might cause the gap to narrow? And the first obvious statement is, well, the environment for blacks is going to continue to improve. And the second one is that the Flynn effect will come to the rescue. OK, let's think about it. the environment will continue to improve. Here I'm going to have to really skip over a lot. Uh, some of you in the room are familiar with the shared and non-shared environment. It's more complex than I have time to explain. Real quickly, radically simplifying, what what changes IQ is not as much the things you think it is uh, as most people assume. Basic schooling is very important. That's no doubt about that. But any of you who think that uh, uh, putting a really fancy mobile over your baby's crib is going to raise their IQ are kidding yourselves. And also, if you think you get them into a really good school as opposed to an adequate school, it's going to change their IQs. That's not going to happen either. Among siblings, most of the environmental sources of the difference in IQ are non-shared environment. Another important point is that the effects of shared environment, the socioeconomic variables that we usually think of, fade with time. By adulthood, they have effectively disappeared. Here, Jim and I can talk about this in the questioning period. Jim says, well, you know, you're looking at a phenomenon whereby kids growing up in deprived circumstances get worse and worse relative to whites. I'm saying, well, you know, heritability of IQ increases throughout age for all races. What's going on is, as I look at older people in the group, you know how you look more like your mother or like your father than you did 30 years ago, and you're also acting more like them? Well, the same thing happens with IQ. It gets more and more heritable as time goes on. So you can have a couple of explanations of what's happening, but what I'm really saying to you is that among adults, Improvements in the environment don't give you the clout you think they do. Here's another problem with the environment will continue to improve argument. The shared environment did get better for children born in the 1980s and 90s, but the black-white gap didn't decrease. The, the, the environmental variables in the 1960s when the gap was going down were awful for blacks compared to the 1990s. At this point, there isn't that much difference on a variety of important environmental variables. The percentage of whites who now graduate from high school is about 86%, and the percentage of blacks who graduate is about 81%. You know, there's not a whole lot of bang for the buck you're going to get by closing that gap another few percentage points. <clears throat> Finally, on the environmental issue, a lot of adoption studies are, are useful here. It is true that the environment can have a huge effect. You lock a kid in a closet for the first couple of years of their life or don't talk to them at all, as Jim said. That can have an effect on IQ. But once you get to a nearly adequate environment, even though it may not look very good to a lot of us, probably you've gotten most of what you're going to get from environmental changes. I, I, um, I apologize for moving through all that so very quickly, but we can come back to some of the more important issues later. The Flynn effect will come to the rescue. I don't know how irritating it was to be told after the bell curve came out that uh, we didn't understand that the black-white gap was going to disappear because we didn't know there was this thing called the Flynn effect. We named the Flynn effect. We uh, gave it its first large uh, discussion accessible to a general audience. Here, I, I just put up on the screen there a recent article which <clears throat> was done by some Dutch psychometricians um, familiar to both uh, uh, Jim and Bill. Uh, using extremely complex uh, methodologies. Do not ask me to explain them. Um, I will immediately turn the question over to Jim if you do. Um, and I put up there a long paragraph from the conclusions. I will again read the parts I've highlighted in red. No, I'm not going to read the top part because I'm running out of time. 
the, down there at the bottom. It appears, therefore, that the nature of the Flynn effect is qualitatively different from the nature of black-white differences in the United States. And following that, implications of the Flynn effect for the black-white difference, uh, differences appear small. And we can go into that in more detail later. Reasons to think that the remaining IQ gap will persist. Chris, how am I doing on time? I've been racing through this. Yeah, okay. First is the relationship of G to both the black-white difference and the heritability. And second is the dysgenic pattern of fertility among black-white women. Way back when uh, <clears throat> Charles Spearman discovered G back in the early part of the 20th century, he formulated what subsequently became known as Spearman's hypothesis. He said that the black-white difference would be the largest in the tests most saturated with G. I'm referring to the same phenomenon that Jim referred to about uh, the relationship to the complexity of the task. Uh, Arthur Jensen has taken the lead in testing the Spearman hypothesis, and at this point, in one respect, it is no longer a hypothesis. It's simply a fact. Controversy remains about what it means, all right? I'm not trying to diminish that. The simple statement that there is a Pearson's R correlation, to put it that way, between the G loadings of tests and the magnitude of the black-white difference has been established beyond any reasonable empirical doubt. Okay, that's one clump of things to remember. Second is that G is the most highly heritable component of IQ. And the third is that as we've been learning more about G in the last 10 or 15 years, we've learned more and more ways in which it is correlated with a variety of physiological phenomena, from glucose metabolism to reaction time and a bunch of other things. Most recently, well, I don't even know if it's most recently. These things happen so fast. There has been studies which have found important correlations between the volume of specific parts of the frontal cortex, gray matter, and uh, IQ test scores, and the source of that correlation is G. And the volume of that gray matter is under, in the words of the authors of the article, tight genetic control. Here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that this proves that there is a large genetic component to the black-white difference. I am saying this. If we've got a difference which varies in magnitude according to G, if we know that G is highly heritable, and if we increasingly have reason to think that G has a physiological substrate that is very important, I'm saying that's circumstantial evidence that you're talking about differences that are going to be very resistant to change. However, in a way, what I'm referring to here is an unfolding story where I think the best course is for people like Jim and me to relax because in a few years we'll know what it says anyway. Here's a simpler statement that we can be fairly confident about. The National Longitudinal Survey of Youth has, at this point, one of the unique databases uh, insofar as it has a nationally representative sample of women born 1957 to 64 whose fertility has been followed to completion. As of the 2004 interview wave, the youngest woman was 40 years old. So for once, and these have been very hard to, data to come by in other uh, databases, for once we really have a complete picture of fertility in this generation. 58% of black children were born to women with IQs below the black mean. 50% of white children were born to women with IQs below the white mean. When you start with a headwind like that, uh, you have a real problem in making much progress in closing a gap because you don't need to argue about the specific degree of heritability of IQ. We know it's large, whether it's 40 or 6 percent, 60 percent or higher, is in a sense immaterial. You take the combination of non-shared environment, which we don't know how to systematically affect, and heritability, you don't have a lot left to tweak. And if you have that kind of reproductive pattern among black women versus white women, it leads me to this conclusion. Given everything that is known about heritability of IQ and the remaining environmental differentials between blacks and whites, unless the dysgenic pattern of black fertility changes, any narrowing of the IQ gap will be confined to children. Among adults, the IQ gap is unlikely to do any better than remain unchanged, and it could widen. Uh, that, I think, is the fundamental uh, demographic pattern that we have to face uh, the consequences of.
And I would say that many of the graphs that I just showed you with the failure to narrow the gap since the 1970s, those born in the 1970s, is an indication that that phenomenon is already at work. Jim, we're back to you. Well, good discussion of all of that in 10 minutes, but I'm sure much of it will come up during the discussion period. Everyone can hear, right? Uh, the G thing, I think, is far less significant than is normally felt. Let me just see if I can show you why on this blackboard. Now, take three IQ tests, one, two, three. And one has a G loading of 0 0.70, and one has 0 0.73, and one other has 0.76. Those are fairly typical differences. The differences in G loadings are not great. And let us imagine that at a certain time, black kids are 15 points behind whites on all three of those tests. And let's imagine they gain five points on all three and cut it to 10. Well, Wichert's would tell you then that the pattern of gains doesn't show a gain on the G factor. And he's quite right, isn't it? I mean, if there was a gain on the G factor, it would be slightly higher on test two and slightly higher again on test three, wouldn't it? You know, because those is how the G pattern goes. And the gains are dead even. There's no replication of the G factor whatsoever. And yet, between those two periods, on all three tests, the gap has fallen from 15 to 10 points. So let's project that into the future. You know, we get another fall to five points and another fall to zero points on all three. Well, lo and behold, the IQ gap will have gone away, the G gap will have gone away, and at no point along the uh, spectrum along will there have been a correlation with G in terms of Wichart's analysis. You know, uh, I can't go into greater detail than that now, but I can give you the proof. And that is that when Bill and I looked at our data, and we looked at how much the IQ gap diminished, we then looked at how much the G gap had diminished, and it was 90%. You know, it was a little less than the IQ gap, but not much. It may be that the 100 meter has a higher G loading than the high jump. And it could be that blacks make even gains on both. But if they keep gaining on both, they will eliminate the gap on both. And the gap will go away on all the WIC subtests and we can forget about G. There is also an interesting paper in the mill. I think it's by Wichert's, isn't it? Yes, in which he argues that G is fundamentally sociological in origin. Uh, that, you know, it's, uh, it's not at all <laughs> obvious that it has a biological origin. I think it has a very slight biological origin. I wouldn't discount that it has some, you know, physiological substratum. Note also that it went away in Germany. That is, when the IQ gap disappeared, as we would have expected, the G gap disappeared. So that argument I don't think means much. Uh, as for the heritability of IQ, that is quite true. Family environment does not have permanent effects. Here we come to the Dickens-Flynn model, and I'll say right here that the mathematical elegance of that model is entirely Dickens. Flynn's contribution was essentially to say, I don't understand this, and there is a slight mistake there, and here's how I think we should present it. Though I wanted to present it in track, he wanted to present it in basketball, and I gave in. I'd, I don't like basketball much and would prefer track. But at any rate, the Dickens-Flynn model is based on the transients of environment. But that doesn't have anything to do with closing a gap between two groups environmentally. Let us imagine that the verbal difference in the black and white home before the age of four is a significant cause at that age. It's not a matter that it puts an imprint in clay in the brain that remains forever. Uh, that's quite true, as Charles Murray says. What happens is that when the kids go into school, a new environment takes over that is slightly worse 
And then when they get to about 14 or 15, another new environment takes over that's slightly worse. So even if an environment has not a permanent imprint, if there are a succession of environments, each of which is somewhat worse than the last, well, even though the influence of environment is immediate, you're going to get a loss of an IQ gain with age because each successive environment is a little worse in black and white terms than the one that preceded it. So you don't have to have permanent imprints to explain a loss with age. If it's each succeeding environment is worse, it's going to go down. Now, as to the evidence that the gap declines with age, Jensen made an exhaustive analysis of Audrey Shuey's data, and he found exactly the same decline with age that we found in the recent data, though, of course, from a higher level. You know, they were declining in age on that massive database, and we intend to publish an even more massive database soon that we think will show the same thing. I think the challenge to Charles Murray and others is that if they agree that the IQ gap is at present for four-year-olds something like five points, find me a group of 14-year-olds where it's less than 10 points. And I'll look at that with interest. I think they'll have an awfully hard time finding a good sample of 14-year-olds where it's less than 10. So I don't have much doubt about the decline with age. I think it's there. Am I optimistic about the future? When I view American society, I'm always filled with pessimism. Uh, even from abroad, I, I become more pessimistic. One of the things that makes me think Charles just could be right, and I don't know that he is, uh, I still lean to our view, is that I can't see any real environmental improvement between black and whites over the last 20 or 30 years that would cause them to gain. The percentage of children in single-parent homes is now up to 60% in the black community, much higher than it was 30 years ago. The white percentage has gone up to 20, but the gap is greater than it ever was. All of my data tells me that you have three points lower IQ if you're in a solo parent home. So there hasn't been progress there. The average income of those homes compared to whites is higher today than it was 30 years ago. The assets of black families are less today compared to whites than they were 30 years ago. There seems to have been a mild improvement in schooling. But before we got our data, if you had asked me purely on environmental variables whether there had been progress, I'd have said, why would you expect that? You know, it doesn't seem to me to be any great environmental improvement. But somewhere along there, there was a big improvement. Uh, I admit, we're not quite sure just when it happened. Well, will it improve in the future? Well, that depends on people in America and people in this room. I can think of a lot of environmental variables to manipulate other than physiological ones. I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that it's bad to go into school with an impoverished vocabulary, and therefore it would be good if those children had more stimulation. I would like to see drop-in centers that single parents could go to and not to park their children, but to be surrounded by sub-professionals, to engage their kid in talk, tapes, books, you know, things that would give single parents less isolation. When I worked with Saul Alinsky behind the yards, uh, I found black girls of 17 with three kids in high-rise apartment houses who are six blocks from Lake Michigan who had never seen the lake. <laughs> you know, something could be done about that it is possible that that variable could be manipulated. Uh, when black kids go to school, they become immersed, in my opinion, in a black youth culture where you don't see kids playing chess, you don't see kids discussing books. It wouldn't be bad if they spoke a different language, but they speak a substitute for English that will not help them in the mainstream of American society. And I think blacks have to realize there's a price to be paid for that. And then finally, of course, at the end of school, blacks tend to end up in less cognitively demanding jobs. It's interesting that in retirement, they seem not to lose any more ground with whites, and that I presume that in retirement, almost everyone is in a cognitively impoverished environment. So there, there, there may be some reason for that. So that's all I can say in 10 minutes, I presume. My 10 minutes is about up, isn't it? Um,
You've got one more minute. But I've got one more can... minute. Well, let's see if there's anything else here. Uh, well, I'll just say uh, very quickly then that I don't trust the Peabody much. Uh, but on this dysgenic tendency, I'll use my minute on that. What this means is if you do the mathematics the, and you look at the difference between the upper half and the lower half of the black IQ curve, they would be losing about eight-tenths of a point per generation. Now, the Dickens-Flynn model says that the direct influence of genes on brain physiology in regard to IQ is perhaps something as low as 0.3 of the variance. So you have to discount that. I mean, maybe they are losing something like a quarter of an IQ point to a third of an IQ point per generation through dysgenic mating, maybe a little more. But uh, even that is not obvious. And that worries me a good deal less than the environmental factors. Jim, th thank you very much. Charles? Okay. Uh, let's see if we can focus in on a few issues that, that are emerging. I think the age issue is the most interesting. Uh, I'll, start, I'll start with that. 1999 and 1998 magnum opus, uh, the G factor, uh, characterizes the relationship of age to the size of the black-white gap. It says, well, it goes up uh, from very small levels to about 0.7 standard deviations by the age of six and rapidly rises thereafter to the usually observed uh, 1 to 1.1 standard deviations before the end of elementary school. The WISC data, I think, are unusual uh, in, in showing this very steady downward trend, and we can argue about that, or the best way to argue about it is with data. And so if uh, you guys are putting out a more massive study, I will wait and, with great interest to see that. But I will say that, that it has not been characteristic for these uh, age-related changes to persist after late elementary school. The more interesting issue here is the issue of heritability. Are we looking at an increasing black-white difference with age for a very logical argument, you know, blacks are in a worse environment and this, that you get cumulative uh, disadvantages, or is it because of increasing heritability? And here I think you have to go to some very important, although complex, work done by the late David Rowe, a uh, brilliant psychometrician at the University of Arizona, I believe, uh, published uh, uh, in the 1990s. He did a number of articles, but, but the main one, I think, was called uh, Only Skin Deep, if I recall correctly. And it go, went through an exhaustive uh, quantitative analysis of the developmental processes of IQ among blacks and whites. Simplifying a great deal, he says, look, if there is a difference caused by the environment, if, if, if black IQ development is, is deformed, as it were, uh, by these, you can see it statistically in a variety of ways. And his conclusion at the end and the reason for the title, uh, No More Than Skin Deep or Only Skin Deep, was that the developmental processes of IQ in black and white kids is exactly the same. There is no room in his analysis, um, a very impressive analysis, no room in his analysis for this mysterious deforming factor, this dark star that affects blacks and not whites. Heritability increases with age among whites. It increases with age among Chinese. It increases with age among blacks. And you, all you need is the argument that it increases with age and the correlation is getting higher. And that is the reason for saying, well, an alternative logic as to why you end up with the same size of, uh, with the size of of the black-white difference among adults, once they grow to adulthood, that you've had among their parents. Uh, those two arguments, it seems to me, have to be informed by some kind of analysis. And here is where I think that, that you and Bill have been working at it. And David Rose specifically, I think, had a comment arguing with you on this. Uh, uh, Jim and Bill have been working at a model which says, here is how these environmental effects could occur. The question is, empirically, does it pan out? And I believe that is a question mark because that is a debate that is still ongoing. Uh, vocabulary. A good, interesting uh, chicken and egg problem. Is it that black scores on IQ tests with vocabulary tests, is it that they are low because they don't hear enough vocabulary? Or is the reason they don't hear vocabulary is because maternal IQ is low, which results in 
not very many words being spoken to them. Uh, I say it's a chicken and egg problem, again, without saying here's what it is, because I don't have the answer to it. I will make a couple of quick observations. The first is that with the original vocabulary subtest in the Wexler back in the 1930s, I guess, they weren't even going to include that as a subtest uh, in the IQ battery because they assumed it was so culturally determined that it would be useless as a measure of IQ. And it was only over a period of time that the argument was first made and then evidence adduced for this argument that the reason that kids develop a large vocabulary isn't because they hear the words. Because you have lots of kids from upper middle class homes with professor parents who don't acquire really good scores and vocabulary tests. It's do you have the kind of mind which when it hears a word says, I wonder what that means, or which naturally fits that into the context of the sentence. In other words, acquiring vocabulary is very heavily loaded toward kids with brains, uh, to put it uh, that way. Here's another interesting thing about the vocabulary test. The General Social Survey, which is a large nationally representative survey that's given every couple of years, has a 10-item vocabulary test. And I certainly am not going to bet the ranch on anything involving that 10-item uh, test, but they do give it, and they have been giving it for years and years and years. And not only that, the words have never changed. Uh, there are the same words now that they were using in the first surveys uh, 20 years ago or whenever it started. Well, the black-white difference in that has been going down. And not only has it been going down, it's been going down among kids born in the 1980s. There is a problem. Given this test, we don't have to rely on the black-white difference. We can just look at raw scores because the items have been the same ever since. When was the highest mean black score on the 10-item vocabulary test among blacks born in 1945? or the five, uh, highest five-year, because these are small samples, the highest five-year aggregation was 1945 to 1949. The only reason that the black-white gap has been diminishing uh, is because whites have been doing worse and worse. This, by the way, raises an interesting question for IQ tests, where you are not talking about raw scores, you are talking about norm scores, and when I look at that GSS data and I look at any trends in the black-white difference, this is just a generic question, Jim, has nothing to do with our previous discussions. I'm saying to myself, are these changes re reflecting changes in the black population or are they ch reflecting changes in the white population? I leave that as a question. Regarding the German study, Jim, what I'm going to say is going to sound harsh, and I apologize in advance. Uh, it's what I call uh, the rule of one in issues involving all kinds of social policies in which people want the results to come out a certain way. I think of the Perry Preschool Program, which is one which uh, was an intensive intervention program for children, which, unlike any other intensive intervention program, actually sh showed some statistically significant positive results. You have this library of studies which show no effect, and you have poor little Perry Preschool with a control group of 40 kids or a experimental group of 40 kids, very small, the one that everybody cites all the time is Perry Preschool. It's the rule of one. If you can find one study that says what you want it to say, you, you fly with that one. Well, we've got this study that was done, what, 30 years ago, the Eiferth study, 1950s, 1960s? 1960s, 1960s it was done 40 years ago. And you say to yourself, gee, if, if it worked with the, the kids of, of black GIs, and Germany was not a real good place for black kids to be raised, let's go see if, if it can happen anywhere else. Or if it happened in Germany later after the environment got better. Did it happen in France? Did it happen in Denmark? Did it happen in South Dakota? Did it happen in Africa after they stopped colonization? Well, the answer is we have IQ data on blacks and whites from all over the world. We have, I, we have data on adoption studies where black children are adopted into middle-class white homes. We have reams of studies. And you have the one lone example of those German children after World War II that everybody always cites. Um, show me others that have the same results, and I'll get more interested. I am told, and by the way, I'm not an expert on this, I am told there are other problems besides the obvious one that, that uh, Jim already described with the eye for the study, which is that you did not have a random sample of blacks, and he described that very well. I've also been told, and you can tell me whether I'm right or wrong, that some 23% of the fathers were not actually um, 
Sub-Saharan blacks, they were North Africans. Um, there are a variety of technical problems. This is not a study, let me put it this way. If this was a study which had showed anything but no difference, nobody would have ever paid any attention to it. It would be completely lost in the literature today. The only reason anybody talks about it is because it is a, one of the very rare examples of finding no difference. My interpretation, how am I doing on time? Just about there. Uh, real quickly, I think that what we have seen is genuine improvements in the black environment after World War I, huge improvements. As blacks moved out of the rural south and into the northern cities especially, or any kind of cities, as basic education was provided, we saw a major narrowing of the black-white difference, which is appropriate because there is a very large component to that, which is the shared environment. And I think we got all of the juice out of the shared environment improvements that we're going to get. And that what we're looking at now is a residual difference, which is partly non-shared environment, may very well be partly genetic, but I don't really care about the sources of it. Uh, it has the earmarks of being a very persistent difference, and I'll leave it at that. I want to ask, uh, I have a question for each of you before I get out of the way and let other people ask questions. Charles, I want to press you a little bit more on uh, the point that Jim raised uh, and uh, uh, about uh, changes in the uh, social circumstances of blacks and whites between the 60s and the 90s. In your presentation, you said, well, clearly it was much better in the 90s. Uh, Jim challenged you on that. I think you were thinking about optimism or pessimism about the future, but it's but if we go a little bit deeper, it really goes to this question of whether things uh, leveled off and have not improved in the last 20 years the way that 20, 25 years the way they did in the previous to uh, imagine many uh, ways in which the circumstances of black Americans improved uh, dramatically, the emergence of uh, substantial uh, black middle class and advancement in the professions and so forth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as Jim noted, and in fact, I believe as Charles Murray has noted in some of the things that he has written, uh, the cultural circumstances of uh, very poor uh, African Americans have in many respects worsened. To make things even more complicated, uh, uh, the cultural circumstances of some very poor white Americans, uh, a phenomenon that you yourself have called the emerging white underclass, uh, have worsened as well. In any event, it's not so clear when you just kind of brush it aside and say the leveling off that I see cannot be explained by a deteriorating environmental circumstance as between the races. It's, that's not at all obvious to me. Good question. You have to say that to the president of your organization. When he, it is a good question. Um, a couple of the environmental variables that are obviously important with intellectual development are access to basic education and nutrition. And on both of those points, I think the case is easy to make that the a great improvement occurred in the circumstances of black Americans. And it occurred uh, from the post-World War period, but also through the 1970s and into the 80s. So for example, uh, Better not quote me on this, I think I'm remembering it right, but back in the 1960s, you were looking more at like a 30 or 40 percent black graduation rate from high school, whereas it's, it was up to the uh, 80 percent now. And, and that increase was fastest in uh, the 1960s and 70s and, and 80, early 80s. And uh, that was important. Nutrition, I think, whether it's optimal or not, did it get to be good enough? I'd say there were lots of malnourished black kids, I bet, in the early part of the century, and that stopped happening. The question of family background, you're quite right. I have made much of my professional career around the issue of the increase in single-parent homes and the disastrous effect this has on a variety of outcomes. In the analysis that you have in your folders in the Intelligence uh, magazine, Journal article, uh, one of the independent variables is uh, whether the child was born to an unmarried woman. And basically, among the many bad outcomes that result from being born to uh, an unmarried woman or being born without a father, to put it another way, uh, lower IQ is not one of them, as far as I can tell. It drops out of the equation once you control for maternal IQ. So 
I'm not arguing with that kind of deterioration, but I'm saying that that doesn't seem to be nearly as important in IQ as education, basic education and nutrition is. I would also add one other thing, and that is with almost all of these samples except, except for the NLSY, blacks in the deep inner city under the worst of circumstances are undercounted. I'm not saying they're more undercounted now than they were before. I'm just saying that that the kids who are getting the worst end of the stick uh, are at least likely to show up in, in most of the samples where we measure the black-white difference. Uh, Jim, you were very helpful to me in using these uh, uh, artful analogies, the triple axle and differences in uh, men and women's height at different stages of life, uh, to, uh, to, underst to, to understand some of the complexities for somebody like myself that's not uh, conversant in a lot of these statistical things. Uh, and uh, I want to I offer a, a kind of a, a sharp example uh, that most people would say is, com is very physical and heritable, uh, but that may, might not be. And uh, to, to see if, see if you can give me an illustration here to help understand these nature versus nurture ones. And that is the... Uh, uh, the striking, I was the complete dominance of uh, individuals from West Africa in middle and long distance running. I understand you're a runner, so you probably know this uh, phenomenon. You see it in, in every marathon. It's it's well established, and you can you can kind of somebody casually off the top of his head can think of uh, that it's highly uh, uh, physiological. But you know, when you think about it, it could be cultural. It could be environmental. Uh, if we actually dug down to understand uh, this uh, uh, this uh, sharp difference, which is probably not just way way out at the tail, but probably uh, uh, applies to whole populations, how, how would you think about that kind of a group difference? Well, that one, uh, I think you have. To take. Let me get my mic here. It is. That one, I think you have to take into account the fact that we know that altitude training helps white athletes and all athletes. And given that you have a direct intervention here, I would think being born at altitude and running to school 20 miles every day at altitude must mean some selection over a number of generations of a physiological type that actually has a greater capacity to benefit from altitude training and does, you know, can outperform other people at sea level. Uh, it would be mad to think that there are no physiological differences between the races. Uh, everyone knows that skin color is on average a physiological difference. So on the athletes, I think there is a genetic component in favor of black middle distance runners. But it's, but it's one that has a, uh, an environmental cause. Oh, and time. also, yeah. too, I mean, obviously, if you, if you, as some of these guys do, if you look at their life histories, the nearest school was 20 miles away, and they ran to it, uh, which is a purely environmental factor. But it may be that their physical type over time is more efficient in converting oxygen to energy in the blood. You know, it could be. No, no reason to discount that possibility. Very good. We're going to open uh, the session to questions and comments from the audience. I see a lot of hands. Uh, we have uh, 25 minutes, and I'm going to try to get to everybody. I'm going to start up front, and I'm going to work my way around. We'll start at this table, and then we'll move to the back. If you could please wait until the... Uh, microphone comes to you and introduce yourself briefly before your question. We'll start with uh, Bill Dickens. Uh, all right. I guess I, I don't need an introduction <laughs> from the Brookings Institution. Um, uh, I, I just wanted to offer uh, uh, an alternative to your pessimism, Charles, and uh, uh, if everyone would take out the copy of my article with Jim in, uh, uh, in the packet you were given and turn to the third page, figure two, which is this one right here, you'll see a very different picture from the ones that Charles was showing you. Instead of showing everything going up or showing the black-white gap closing up through 1970 and then flattening out, you see something very different, which is the black-white gap closing pretty continually on all tests at all points in time. What accounts for the difference between these two ways of presenting the data? Charles was presenting all of his data arrayed by the birth year of the person. We're presenting our data by the year in which the test was administered. Now, as a first-order thing, mathematically, you cannot tell the difference between a birth order effect or birth year effect and a year effect because, if you think about it, 
what is uh, what is a person's uh, uh, birthday? It's the uh, it, or if you take the uh, uh, the birthday is simply there's going to be the test year minus their uh, uh, minus their age. Okay, so they're they're mathematically linear, completely dependent on each other. You can't distinguish the effects. That said, one can look at the ancillary results that one gets. So, for example, one can plot a chart like this or the ones that Charles was doing and then look at what the values of the other variables in the equation have to be in order to fit the data. And as Charles noted, when he does the WISC, for example, by uh, birth year as opposed to by the year in which the test is given, he gets that the black-white gap actually narrows as kids get older, whereas the conventional wisdom is the opposite that the black-white gap grows uh, with age. And in fact, when I've done that analysis in our entire, for all the tests in our data set, when I use Charles' specification of using birth year as the control, I find that I get a statistically significant white, a narrowing of the black-white gap with age, whereas when I use the year in which the test was administered, I get the more conventional result that the black-white gap actually grows with age. And also, just as an aside, uh, I've looked at the National Assessment of Educational Progress reading scores on which there have been the biggest gains. And impressionistically, anyways, if you look at when, if you line things up by year in which the tests were administered, you see that the years in which the uh, blacks do best uh, are, are lined up. So that, that if you think that what's going on is a year effect, that there are certain years in which society in general is, is helping kids at all ages, then you see that those, are, those years all line up. Whereas if you do it by birth year, then you see the peaks at different points in the distribution and not all lined up, suggesting again to me that the proper way of thinking about it is year effects as opposed to birth year effects. I'm not going to expand, respond at length except to say that what Bill just did, who, by the way, has shown admirable patience for a co-author to be silent all this time, must have been <laughs> agony for him. Uh, this is complicated stuff. And if we've done anything today, I hope it is that for those of you who may have come in here thinking that black-white differences in IQ were either meaningful or, meaningful or else uh, meaningless, I hope you understand all the ways in which it's tougher than that. Everything that Bill's just said is interesting and important and is still in the process of being worked out. Um, I'll just leave it at that. Uh, this is a disagreement that has been going on for uh, Henry Aaron Brookings, um, a disagreement that's been going on for many years. But actually, I was struck at the huge degree of overlap between accepted facts. And I'd like to press you a bit on the source of the highly diverse interpretation. Uh, you both agree that test scores have narrowed significantly in Maine. You both agree that they will be very hard to close. Uh, the difference is that Flynn and Dickens have a theory uh, that integrates both environmental and genetic uh, explanations, and that at least Jim claims uh, in his Cambridge Press book uh, is consistent with all of the relevant facts uh, at work here. And then, Charles, you said something that I found absolutely staggering. You said you really didn't care whether the difference that persists is genetically based or environmentally based. It was just going to be hard to close, which brings me to my question. I wonder whether the differences which have persisted for so many years are not rooted, despite the high intellectual tone that you have scrupulously maintained, in differences in political agendas. Uh, you, Charles, I think are very skeptical of the kinds of collective governmental interventions uh, that would promote changes in environment that Jim, I think, uh, generally would support. So I'm wondering whether uh, those differences in political goals may not in a significant degree lie at the base of the seemingly surprising differences given the large areas of overlap. And I really do wish you would explain how it is you say that you're indifferent as to whether the explanations are genetic or environmental. Henry, um, 
Dick Kernstein and I actually made quite a point of this in the bell curve, and I'll just I'll go over it very quickly. From a public policy standpoint, the issue is not whether you have a genetically determined dif group difference or an environmentally grouped, uh, determined group difference. It certainly is not important at any given moment in time. Suppose we knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that the entire black-white difference uh, was entirely genetic. Uh, does that make me smarter than Tom Sowell? No. Uh, it, it has no bearing on, on my relationship or anybody's relationship to any other individual at a given point in time. Look at it from another perspective. Uh, suppose we knew for, without a shadow of a doubt that it was entirely environmental. What would that suggest that we do tomorrow that we have not already tried? And, and here, Henry, doggone it, I'm not talking from a political agenda. I think, I deeply believe, I am talking from a careful appraisal of the empirical literature on interventions to try to raise IQ. And so I, I am talking about environmental. If they are environmental, I'm saying we know a lot more about the environmental role in intellectual development than we used to. And it is not nearly as rich a source of changing IQ as we used to think it was. So it's not a case of uh, uh, Jim's liberal and, and I'm a libertarian, and so therefore we're reading these data differently. It's, it's I who would say, Jim, given the degree to which uh, we've had the, this you know, parade of failures and attempts, very concentrated attempts, to change the environment to increase IQ, how can you persist in this delusion that the environment is going to change things? And I will turn it over to you. Well, it's not a miracle. That is, if it's not genes, it's got to be environment of some sort. And if it's not miraculous, we have to look at what works and what doesn't. And here I agree with Charles. Facts are a wonderful educator. Uh, until I looked at the health statistics, I thought, gee, one of the things we ought to do is really go all out to educate black women not to smoke while pregnant. Well, I still think we ought to educate women not to smoke while pregnant. But that isn't the difference. You know, that isn't the thing. And Jensen says maybe it's breastfeeding. If you look at his most recent book, he thinks, uh, you know, the G factor, that breastfeeding is a big thing. Well, I'm very skeptical about that in terms of the data I've looked at. Uh, first, I don't know that anyone knows they do breastfeed less. Uh, I've never seen any evidence of that sort. And I'm convinced, of course, that the Dickens-Flynn model explains what you're talking about. That is, the relative impermanence of family environment. You cited, for example, the adoption studies. And it's noteworthy that the benefits of the black children from adoption decrease with age, don't they? I mean, that's one of the places where you wouldn't dispute there's an age effect. I should note that Jensen no longer disputes it. When he and Rushton wrote a reply to our article, he didn't object to my characterization of his position now as believing that there is a drop-off with age which was parallel to our own. Would he have ever disagreed with that? Pardon? Would he have ever disagreed with that? Oh, I thought you cited Jensen as someone who was skeptical about the drop-off with age. All of his early work did disagree with it when he did his Bakersfield study. No, I mean in the adoption studies. Oh, no, I'm talking now about the general issue. Not, not the general issue. I mean the general issue as to whether it decreases with age. I mean it increases with age. He now accepts that completely at much the same rate we do. He didn't dispute it in the least. And if you look at his 1980 book, he analyzes Shuey's data in that regard. You have to go back to the stuff he did in the 70s for him to disagree with that. Now, this you know. I'm, I'm not trying to bully you with references. But uh, Jensen has come on board on this one, I'm quite convinced. And I'll show you the stuff later. We, we, we won't stop talking after this. We're still friends, after all. <laughs> we have, uh, let's see, I'm going to take this place and this gentleman in that order. And then we have some questions back here. Hi, Patty Moore with Education Daily. Um, could you both address the policy implications, specifically uh, No Child Left Behind's goal of closing the achievement gap. Um, because we state we are spending a great deal of money at the state, local, and federal level in measuring how well schools are educating children. So going back to your point that you, you don't expect any more improvements in the shared environment or basic education, could you, could you address that? Uh, Jim, do you want to go first? 
Well, uh, I, I mean, the slogan, no child left behind, is insane, of course. I mean, left behind what? Uh, it's easy to have no child left behind in grade. You just promote everybody. <laughs> and if you lower the standards, as Charles Murphy has pointed out, low enough in terms of what a pass is, you can pass practically everybody. Uh, I wouldn't discourage anyone from spending money on schools. But one of the reasons I've always thought IFIRTH was significant is that it's one of the few areas where the kids were removed from the American black subculture. Now, I now no doubt will be accused of blaming the victim. So let me just say that there once existed in America an Irish subculture that was educationally counterproductive and was cognitively unfriendly. It's not at all abnormal for a dispossessed group to develop a subculture that turns against many things in the larger society. And my view, again, is that we, as Charles Murray points out, it's not that black parents at an early age leave some un indelible handicap that never disappears. It's a step-by-step -step process. And uh, you can put a lot of money into schools, but if a black kid doesn't ever see their parents reading and enjoying books and discussing them. If they go into a teenage group where that isn't true, if they go into a teenage group where their vocabulary is circumscribed in a way that makes it difficult for them to access serious literature, improvements in the schools are good, but they're not enough. You know, you're going to get some return from them. Of course you will. But it's a much larger problem than that. And I do have some suggestions as to things I think would do some good, but I'll have to wait for the next question. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that uh, the proper educational policy has nothing to do with any difference between blacks and whites. Proper education policy is one which enables every child to develop his or her capabilities to the maximum. And the No Child Left Behind Act is an attempt... I think, and I'm actually stealing a line from Howard Gardner here, it, it says it, it's imposing on the whole nation a solution that might possibly make sense for a few of the worst inner city school systems. Uh, it is, I think, uh, as someone who had a child uh, in high school during the uh, first years of the No Child Left Behind Act, um, a disaster for American education and ought to be repealed forthwith. Mal Klein, Accuracy in Academia. Question, do we know what happens to IQs, what the scores when you compare blacks in public schools, private schools, and for that matter, the growing number that are homeschooling? It's a contentious literature. And beyond that, I'm hesitant to go. I have read reports which claim important uh, improvements in black performance in private schools, by, and I've written by reputable scholars. I have also read reports claiming no important difference by reputable scholars, and I have not followed that literature closely enough to adjudicate it. No, I can't comment on that. I think the difficulty is getting, uh, uh, is comparing apples and oranges. I mean, it's very difficult to get samples in private and state schools that you would consider comparable. And then you get the whole question, even if they're comparable on obvious measures, for a parent, black or white, to spend the extra money or to go to the extra step to getting advantageous education probably tells us something very hard to compare, and I don't know of anyone who's done it properly. Edward Cowan, I'm an independent editor and writer. When one takes a test, one has to make an effort. And the longer the duration of the test, two hours instead of 45 minutes, the greater the effort one must make to finish all the questions and solve the more difficult problems. Is there any indication of a difference in motivation between black children and white children with respect to making the effort that's required to do well on the test? The answer is yes, that is an issue which has been studied, and sometimes there have been effects that have been detected. Um, for example, in uh, uh, the AFQT for the NLSY, there has been documentation that a lot of black kids did give up quickly 
Not a lot, some. So enough, enough you had to worry about that. But the more general finding uh, for most tests in the literature has been that this is not a good explanatory variable. There's actually a very nice, elegant way to test that. There's a thing called reaction time tests, uh, where they're very simple. Uh, you have your finger on a button and another other and a row of buttons, another light goes on, and you simply move your thumb from the home button to the to the target button. Everybody gets every item right. What they're measuring electronically to thousands of a second is the reaction time to get your thumb off that button. But they also measure movement time. Uh, the reaction time is the cognitive process. The movement time is a purely physical one. And in this case, what you find consistently is that there is a black-white difference in reaction time, but blacks are better in movement time. This goes to the motivation issue. You know, if you have a black kid who's, <laughs> this is dumb, he's also not going to outperform in movement time. It, it's, it seems to be a very nice sort of self-contained control for motivation. And you find these kinds of differences, uh, typical black-white differences, in these various environments. I don't know that there is a difference in trying in the test room, but that's not the important factor. In the book I'm about to publish, I point out that when you go into the test room, you can try as hard as you want, but if you haven't developed certain habits of mind by dealing with cognitive problems similar to those tested, you're going to be in trouble. For example, when I took up uh, crossword puzzles, I tried. But I am a man who has always put things as simply and as plainly as possible. I wasn't used to looking for ancillary meanings, tricks between verbs and nouns and so on. And I had to develop the habits of mind to allow me to do well on them. So when I think in these terms, I think again of a larger culture that does not put the premium on the same kinds of cognitive problems that are not only useful on IQ tests, but are useful in our educational system. Now, I do want to say a word about the reaction time research, because this is something where Flynn feels very ill done by. And that is, for years, I've tried to get people to do the, uh, the point-forward basketball game which would be a game in which whoever got the, the, from the home button to the target button had found the open forward and scored a basket and have, let us say, a white female and a black male facing one another, and whoever beat the other on a particular <laughs> point would score the basket. And I very much suspect you would get a change in reaction times under those conditions. I don't think they do test physiological things. When I did a study of Lin Chan and Isink's data, I found that Chinese children are unusually poor on movement time. Movement time. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, but not reaction. Ah, no, they weren't. And that is because they were risk takers. They let go immediately and thought their way to the target <laughs> button, <laughs> while the Anglo Saxon children wouldn't let it go uh, and then went straight to the one. So it was a difference of cultural strategy. I wrote a little article entitled, Do the Chinese Have Better British Brains Than the British Do? And the British Have Better Chinese Brains Than the Chinese Do. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have, there are other, we have other people. Oh, gosh. Hi, uh, Will Salatan from Slate Magazine. Charles, um, when you were talking about the IFRS study, you mentioned that you were told that 20-something 20, 20 percent of the fathers were not sub-Saharan blacks. They were North Africans. Can you tell us why that's relevant and whether that whether if that's a, an important difference, it goes to this question of genetic versus cultural or other environmental factors. Be because um, so, uh, sub-Saharan blacks have lower mean IQs than North African blacks. I mean, that's that's the, the short answer to it. There are IQ differences of all kinds among all, all sorts of different groups. And so that's how that would pertain. Can I comment on sure. Sure. That's quite true. I think it was 23% were the offspring of French black troops. And that, again, is one of the ambiguities in the study. I did try to eliminate other ambiguities. Many people, for example, said that German women might have had a preference for high IQ blacks as people to sleep with.
Uh, a Colonel Chase, you know, there are many different ways of attaining military glory. He spent the war doing correlations between black IQ and venereal disease and going AWOL was his contribution to victory, and he found that it was actually a, a slightly less high-scoring black. That is, the blacks who went AWOL and contracted venereal disease actually had lower than average army IQs. So if you take this as an index who is sleeping with German women, that would be a confound in the other direction. Thank you. Marion Tuby from the Cato Institute. What happens to the black and white uh, IQ difference once you adjust for, black, uh, for rises in black incomes? In other words, uh, when black income increases, you would expect that the cultural background of black children improves as well, not just education-wise, but also the kind of friends that those black kids have. So um, what, what's the evidence? Thank you. Uh, black family income is not increasing as a percentage of white. I mean, they're both increasing, but there's been no, you know, significant gain. And indeed, in the 60% of blacks in solo parent homes, there's actually been a loss compared to white solo parent homes. You know, it's less today as a percentage of family income than it was 30 years ago. I'm going to address that. Uh, oh, I yeah, see. yeah. I'm sorry. I didn't uh, understand what he meant. Point number one is that income does not drop out of the equation uh, in some circumstances uh, when you are controlling for other things. Sometimes income is an important uh, has an important relationship to uh, to offspring IQ. Not a huge one, but but it's there. The larger problem here is the one that is known as the Shaker Heights uh, effect, uh, and this comes from the observation in a lot of uh, affluent suburbs where you have uh, affluent black populations that you still have a substantial gap in the local high schools. And it's called Shaker Heights because that's one of the places that got a lot of publicity. And a uh, University of California anthropologist named John Ogbu actually wrote an entire book about, about this. You know, why is it? And, and the explanations that were given uh, in that book correspond very closely to the kinds of things that Jim's talking about with a black subculture that does not reward and indeed punishes academic achievement. Um, there are other ways to look at that, too, uh, the, which, which is to say, come on, and this, I, I will put this colloquially, uh, how long is this excuse going to go on? You have the children of uh, uh, a black lawyer and a black physician with uh, an income of 300,000 bucks, and they have plenty of books in the home, and uh, they want their kid to achieve, and they certainly have achieved, and you have a whole bunch of them in a community. Uh, how many generations are we going to say, well, uh, it's because of, of some cultural difference? Uh, it's a persistent problem, and it is not limited to Shaker Heights. Here's, here's the statistical way of putting it. Suppose that I control for family socioeconomic status and look at the black-white difference. As socioeconomic status goes up, the absolute magnitude of the black-white difference goes down by on the order of 40 percent in most studies. Okay? The relative difference, you know, the standard deviation difference between an affluent white family and an affluent black family, that has typically either stayed the same or in some cases even increased. I think you have to do a very careful study of these two subcultures. I mean, this is just an anecdote. But the two times ago when I was in America, my neighbors were uh, a black professional, a Jewish professional, and a Chinese professional. Is this the beginning of a joke? No. <laughs> no, I have an include Irishman and light bulbs, so, so you know it's not a joke. You have to. Only Irish are dumb. We know that. But, so it's not a joke. Uh, and uh, after dinner in the Chinese home, kids got down to work spontaneously, and older ones helped younger ones around the table, and that was the way. In the Jewish home, there was a lot of screaming, and then the kids sat down and did their homework. In the black home, if I was over there, and the kids started to do his homework, his black doctor father used to say, let's go out and shoot a few baskets, you know, behind the garage. It's not just socioeconomic status. Children pick up on cues. They can tell the difference between 
because you try to discuss a book with them. When parents ask me how they can improve the intelligence of their children or their interest in books, my first question to them is, how often do you read? How often does your kid see you discussing books? Uh, they take their cues from you, you know. So I think we need a much greater in-depth study. I mean, I know your point. You can always make a prediction so long-range it can never be falsified. But I want to know more about these different professional subcultures. Uh, Marcus Epstein, I'm with the American Cause. Um, we talked about the uh, eight-month-old uh, small gap in IQ. And I remember when I was discussing with one of my professors um, as an undergrad, uh, the things I brought up that there was a gap among three-year-olds, and the professor says, oh, how can they possibly measure IQ among three-year-olds? And I found out that later he began touting the exact same, the eight-month study you brought up. But my question uh, for Dr. Boy is that in a uh, fully pay rush thing comes up with dozens of um, factors where there's a difference between blacks, whites, and Asians, and among them, all blacks are born a few days earlier than whites and Asians. Blacks, when blacks are born, their heads are up while white and Asian babies are up. They can walk faster. They have sex at an earlier age. And basically, all physical development places blacks appear to develop more quickly than whites. So could that also affect why their IQ would be higher at a very young age and then seem to drop off later on? You go first. Uh, You've accurately stated the, the difference in psychomotor uh, uh, development, uh, small motor skills and, for that matter, large motor skills. Uh, to me, the, the small IQ gap in infancy, it remains a cipher. A, I'm not at all confident in the measures. And B, the height of men and women is also very small in infancy, and that's entirely genetically determined. The fact that you have something that grows with time can go either way. Both of us have an explanation for those data that uh, they don't intersect, really. Uh, but may I, may I put in a plea, though, here for we can answer these questions now, a lot of them, if, if, you're, if you're interested in nature versus nurture. We no longer have to treat race as a binary yes-no variable. We don't have to rely on very dubious blood group data or anything else. We now have genetic markers that, that correspond to self-identified ethnicity in 99.9% .9 of the time. But the main point is that we don't have to, we, we can say not that you're black or white, we can talk about the whole range. And we can also include Chinese and South Asians and everyone else. We can then add to that measures of physical appearance. So we can discriminate between the effects that you get because you look a certain way and, and, and your actual genetic makeup. If we want to know the story regarding race and IQ, a study is available to us that will not answer all the questions, but that will answer a great many of them. And, um, and in a way, I think that it, those of us who are on different sides of the argument have a joint interest in sponsoring such a study uh, and doing it impeccably. Just a comment. Uh, I just want to say about Chinese and Japanese Americans, I wrote a book on the subject in 91, and they're one of the best examples of where a persistent ethnic subculture does make a difference. And it's one that persists and persists, and that is you can match Chinese and Caucasian white kids in American schools for IQ, and the Chinese kid will score seven points higher on academic measures, including the Scholastic Aptitude Exam. They'll become professionals at double the rate you would expect them to become professionals. That is matched with IQ as whites do. Uh, so th they are at least one group, you know, where we know that achievement beyond IQ is possible with the right subculture. And they never miss a trick. That is, if an Irish lad is accepted at Stanford Law School and his girlfriend says stay at home and go to the local college, he may do it. A Chinese kid gets a new fiancé. <laughs> Carl Varner. Um, the nature versus nurture um, argument. Um, we know that height of men and women is genetic, but also height can be determined by culture. Um, 
in the long term, would, would these effects go away? Well, the example about height um, is, is kind of a good one. The height of, average height of Japanese has gone up by how many inches in the last uh, 40, 40 years? It's gone a up lot. By well over a standard deviation. Yeah, it's gone up several inches. And that's obviously environmental, better nutrition. Uh, but it's also true that uh, there is a residual difference between uh, Japanese and Caucasians, let's say, that is very unlikely to diminish because we've gotten all the environmental effect we're going to get. And so the, the, I think that we are on different ends of the continuum uh, in how far Jim sees this difference diminishing over time in the same way that better nutrition reduced the height difference, and I'm on the pessimistic side of that. I'd like to just comment very briefly that the twin studies demonstrated that the Japanese height gain was utterly impossible, that height was so much influenced by genes that you'd have had to have had a situation where the nutritional environment of Japanese would have to improve so that the average would have been the upper one-tenth of one percent that existed after the war. And it's a good indication of how these twin studies in underestimate the extent to which environment can have an impact. Because using the same predictions we use on twin studies for IQ, such a height gain of a standard deviation was totally impossible. Hi, I'm Kelly Denson from the Educational Testing Service, and you may have just asked the question I wanted to ask. Um, if IQ is biologically based, then wouldn't that mean that there's little that can be done to reduce the IQ gap? That's one question. Second question is, what recommendations would you have? And then last but not least, how does the nature versus nurture argument translate to the Latino community, who also has achievement issues? Now, I suppose that, that one of the things that is in our future, I don't know whether it's two decades or 100 years from now, are, are ways in which we can do gene therapy and, and we can deal with, with biologically based problems in IQ. Forget about the black-white IQ difference. It would be really nice if we could get rid of mental retardation in all kids, for example. Uh, that's way in the future. And until then, if, to the extent that there is a genetic difference, then that is going to be uh, irreducible. Um, and th then you asked policy. Would you restate the second part of your question? I will reiterate no policy. Well, you know, I do have a policy recommendation that is a change from current practice. You judge people as individuals. You stop judging people as members of group. You stop asking, do we have enough uh, Latinos or whites or uh, Asians or blacks in a given classroom, you say, are we giving a fair shot to everybody who can do the work? Oh, the, the other thing you asked was about the, how does the Latino thing play into it. The very interesting thing that's going on is that there are, uh, forget about IQ specifically, there are lots more genetic differences among groups of all kinds than we re previously thought. We still do not understand this at the level of specific genes, but it is quite possible that Latinos are genetically distinct along a continuum, along a continuum from, let's say, um, the non-Latino whites, for example. Someone described me as a liberal. I'm not. I'm a socialist. And uh, my, my, that's right. And my views on what has to be done about environment are much more sweeping than I'm afraid will ever be tried. But I would have state housing, not, you know, huge high rises, but much more intelligently designed state housing such as we have in New Zealand and you have in Scandinavia. I'd make all of these policies colorblind. I'd help the homeless, whoever they were. I would have the drop-in centers for solo parents, black, white, rich people could take use of them because you don't get the political steam if they're race-based. You know, I'm a political realist. Uh, if it makes race-based... Uh, you don't get white middle-class taxpayers being too interested. And in terms of the black community, I would try and get the black community more cognitively active on every level. I agree with Bill. It's not cohorts. Uh, more uh, articulate grandchildren challenge their grandparents. <laughs> <laughs> and more articulate children challenge teachers and vice versa. It's something that you have to go through the whole community. I'd like to see much more book clubs in the back community. 
Uh, I would like to see the government as employer of last resort, like the Israeli army, so that we don't have hardly any un unemployment in New Zealand. Now you can see why I'm a pacifist, uh, a pessimist. It's not that I don't have solutions. It's just when I look at America, I think, how am I ever going to persuade my fellow Americans to do these things? One final, one, one final question. Yes, sir. Hi, Radcliffe Lewis, Radcliffe Lewis um, Enterprises. Um, I pick up on what you just said, and um, in a way, you kind of half answered my question, the gentleman to the, my right, to my right. Um, because the question that I had was with respect to insistence that blacks engage more in more academic-oriented activity. The question here, and it says, current public policies as applied through instruments of discretionary law enforcement mm. and prosecution today tend to result in action taken against blacks who are studious and are publicly exposed at precipitous moments in their paths to success. Um, the recent killing, for example, two days ago of the young man in New York on his wedding day and the killing of Prince Jones and other men in such places as Prince George's County, the dis this, um, the distribution of, from the, or the disbarment from society and massive incarceration of black men um, who, are of, who are sons of black women feeds the fear of blacks to appear to be studious and black mothers and induces in black mothers a tendency to be a little more protective of their young by allowing them to run with the herd. And when I say you run with the herd, I mean, in other words, to go to the gym instead of the library, to go to the club instead of a concert hall where they can listen to classical music. With the public policy willingly um, inventing, um, providing for and investing in sports for blacks up, over, and above thinking development isn't it kind of a taunt to preach to blacks to expose their children to the discretionary abuse by sovereign authorities without directly challenging the incidents where blacks are um, dis um, basically harmed by such members of public authorities on an individual, individual basis? For example, you may have a police officer who does not have a college degree, who in his own discretion decides to destroy or kill a black. When police and uh, prosecutors of the previous government, such as, um, I don't want to mention the name, but the previous mayor of New York, who was hesitant to step forward against situations where such actions occurred, why should the young blacks take, um, sh why shouldn't they take that, the young black children, take the actions of government as a cue that it is good to follow through, to, um, to not follow through in pursuits of academia. And therefore you have a, um, I just wanted your comment on that and you started half commenting on it and I'd like you to elaborate a little more. Yes, uh, I published a book in the year 2000 which is on the general subject of defending humane ideals but has a section on black Americans and it is inevitable that racial profiles of the sort you talk about will handicap blacks until the social statistics improve. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that I left out as a thing I would do is legalize, you know, heroin and have it supplied cheap uh, to take the profit out of it, to destroy the black drug economy so that a third of blacks wouldn't, males wouldn't serve some time in prison and I think you'd actually have fewer addicts. But on profiles, 21 black police officers undercover have been shot by their white colleagues in New York City alone since World War II, now, while no white undercover officer has ever been shot. A recent study shows that if you show blacks and whites pictures of blacks, some of which appear more black and others more Caucasian, both races, given heinous crimes, will say that the more black-appearing person deserves the death penalty by about 50 percent. Ads sent out uh, in New York and Boston, they sent out credentials to all the advertisements for job vacancies. High-quality 
with a black name, high quality with a white name, and medium quality with both, and the white names got 50% more call blacks. So there are racial profiles that, you know, in every way affect blacks. The reason those racial profiles exist, both in blacks and whites, is the unfavorable social statistics of blacks. So here we really are in a chicken and egg situation. I mean, if black social statistics improve, the profiles will weaken. We are uh, come to the end of this seminar. I'm going to give uh, an opportunity for a last word or two. Uh, first to Charles, and then the last, last word to our guest, James Flynn. Charles? Well, I, I want to both compliment Jim. But Jim has behaved as I expected, uh, but I want to compliment the audience. Uh, I have been through a lot of discussions of black-white test score differences since 1994, and I have never been through one like this, uh, where uh, everybody who has talked about it has dealt with this as a problem which is an empirical problem that you think about and you recognize the complications and uh, the sky isn't falling, but it can be discussed and everybody involved in it is engaged in a good faith effort. And I just cannot tell you uh, how heartening that is. And principal thanks for that uh, need to go to the man who's always been that way, uh, Jim Flynn. Professor Flynn. Well, I would just like to say, uh, compliment someone who isn't here, and that is Arthur Jensen. Uh, much of my research has been because of problems set by Jensen. And how can a man who sincerely speaks what he believes to be the truth be called racist? Uh, if what he said was so absurdly ignorant that you knew someone of his education couldn't really believe it, then you would question his motives. But he's a competent scholar. He's always given me access to his data, just as we've given Charles Murray access to our data. Uh, I again remind you of Mill. I mean, you're not protecting blacks or Chinese or Irish if you make their plight undiscussable. Anything that's undiscussable, you then leave to prejudice and opinion and ignorance. And that's the, they're the only gainers when you ban discussions of this sort. Uh, actually, the last word is mine. I, I would like to thank uh, James Flynn and Charles Murray uh, for their uh, engrossing uh, presentations and commentary, uh, which, I've, which I found exemplary not only in the seriousness and persistence which they have uh, treated uh, these very complex problems, uh, but in how they presented often statistically uh, uh, dense uh, and uh, and uh, issues that uh, would be troubling to many people uh, in a way that was uh, was clear uh, and interesting and left me and I hope many others in the room uh, better educated than when we began. Thank you, and I want to wish uh, Jim uh, uh, successful travels in the rest of his tour. We are adjourned. <laughs>